All right, folks, this uh, video is all about things that you would want to take notice of to help you determine sedimentary environments, things to notice in sedimentary rocks. So let's take a look at some of these different characteristics here. First picture, we have these very thick layers, especially at the top here. Notice that big, thick layer. Right? Below that, we have finer and thinner layers. This one is composed mainly of these finer, thinner layers, but then we have thicker layers potentially at the top as well. This is going to tell us something about possibly what deposited them, how long uh, they were being deposited for. We have gradational boundaries, one like this that goes kind of from fine and kind of coursing upwards, looks like that, right? This probably indicates, you know, if it grades from one into another, we're probably not dealing with much erosion. Sharp boundaries, on the other hand, these probably indicate erosion. This very sharp contact boundary, this, this sediment here, dug into this lower sediment as it was being deposited. Types of bedding, parallel bedding, right? It goes back to uh, uh, Steno's law of original horizontality. Right? That's all of our uh, sedimentary layers are laid down horizontally. Cross bedding, we discussed that already. That can tell us uh, not only what direction material is being transported, but possibly what uh, what uh, 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 force was depositing these these uh, uh, sediments as well. Again, these big, tall cross bedding sets. Notice the size of the trees here. These are likely indicating that these are fossil slip faces on sand dunes. And then gradational bedding, going from coarse to fine. This is called a bauma sequence. This is an underwater landslide, essentially, where as this material goes shooting down the canyons underwater, right, the, the, the heavier stuff settles first and lighter and lighter and lighter settles on top. So you get coarse at the bottom and then fining upward towards the top. Looking at breaches, right? Breaches being those uh, those uh, um, uh, cobble size and gravel size fractions that uh, that don't have you know that have very you know kind of sharp edges to them, right? So we can have a breccia with a rocky matrix. This may indicate you know something coming out of a steep mountain from breaking off, right, and it's coming right down into this say alluvial fan here. Whereas a breccia with a muddy matrix, right? These rocks are more suspended in mud than in rock. This may indicate something like a, you know, a fossil debris flow, right? Big, a big mud flow that's, that's carrying in mud and debris and water and all this kind of stuff uh, down the mountain. Conglomerates. Now, conglomerates are the ones that show more distance of transport, rounding. Right? So... Uh, the sorting and the rounding in there can tell us, you know, maybe we have a river channel environment. This, again, looks like a pretty high energy stream as all the particles in it are fairly large. Most of those small particles being transported through the system. An alluvial plain, this is where we have um, uh, sediments to be deposited out on a, uh, 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 say, a, a stream plain right? or floating out of a glacier. Or we can have these in high energy beach deposits, right? Go take a look at you know, kind of northern Lake Michigan or Lake Superior beaches. A lot of them have these big rocks because there's lots of energy that hits those those beaches up there, right? especially in the winter. Close up characteristics uh, in sandstone. We can take a look here, right? We have you know sand sized grains. We have these various little lines running through here. Now these are secondary staining due to differences in in porosity as we go through this rock right so it travels maybe easier in here this is probably iron stain right layers in sandstone are they flat you know how thick are the sandstone layers or how thin are these layers what do the cross beds look like so we can have you know environments of deposition of sand dunes remember that that uh, wind sorts things very well. We've looked at those cross beds a few times in there, so this will be very well sorted sands, right? Or you know, we have maybe here we have a you know a river sand, a channel sandstone we call it, right? Carving out its channel, and as those migrate back and forth, that'll the the, the sandstone will migrate back and forth across with it, right? Uh, sandstones that form along shorelines and beaches, right? They're going to be full of things that are near shorelines and beaches, like fossils and seashells and stuff, right? Uh, deltas are going to have, you know, uh, alternating sand and mud, right? Uh, as, as you know, the little, those, those braided rivers kind of come and go or move back and forth, right? Uh, and then 
Continental Shelf and Slope are looking at a graded bedding here again. So this may be uh, one of those turbidite or, or underwater um, uh, 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 landslide sequences again. Let's look at some fine grain classic rocks. Silt stone is going to be silty. Right? Uh, this can be transported by wind. A lot of times silt is transported off the front of glaciers by wind and deposited as a sediment called loess, L-O-E-S-S. Uh, mudstones, these are going to be, you know, the floodplain uh, as, as a river floods out and goes over a bank, right? Now it spreads out, it drops energy. Now all that kind of water that's sitting there stagnant when the Grand River floods. Guess what's, you know, sawing out of suspension there? Well, those are your clays and your silts, right? And then shales, which are going to indicate kind of lake or, or marine, deep marine or lagoonal. But again, shale and mudstone can be used completely interchangeably in this class because we're talking about clay-sized particles in both cases. Right? Uh, looking at kind of, you know, muds and, and silts along shore, we can have a shallow sea, kind of coast of mud flat, right? Uh, we can have a lagoon. This is a protected area where material is going to settle very calmly. So we'll get some, some shale forming in there. Deeper seas, again, we can see uh, here's that, that those, those turbidite lands uh, or uh, um, underwater landslide sequences again. Deep, deep marine, you can even get shale again as, as the finest of particles are only able to make it out there. Right? So looking at uh, some different landscapes around here, right? Limestone often forms kind of the backbones of mountains, especially if it's been dolomitized and turned to a dolo stone, right? Uh, limestone with fossils often creates little voids and spaces in it and can create, we know, a soluble limestone. Uh, and this creates a, a karst topography, K-A-R-S-T, or, or cave topography, if you will. Right? And then dolo stone, here's another one, right? So we can have, oh, here's more karst topography. So these all used to be big cave caverns, and now that's kind of getting eaten, you know, been eaten away. So the caves are now open to the, the air here, right? Now, here's another important uh, feature of uh, um, sedimentary environments, right? So let's take a look at, say, a coastal environment, right? They change over time, right? One is not always, you know, just a coastal environment. It changes as, as plate tectonics shift and as, as things shift, right? So here we have, at time one, a beach, right? We're depositing beach sand. Right. At time two, the water level has gone up or sea level has gone up. So now where we were having sand being deposited, now we're, there's a lagoon over there instead of a, a beach. So now we're depositing those muds, those lagoonal muds over top of that. And as sea level raises even farther, now the beach is pushed farther inshore, shoreline retreat, right? Now where we originally had the beach right, and then the lagoon or mud, now it's deep enough that we're seeing limestone associated with, with the coral reef that, that protects that lagoon, right? And this is known as a transgressive sequence, right? This is when sea level is rising or sea level is moving onto land, right? It's encroaching on land. It's transgressing onto land, right? So sea level rise, you'll see sand from the beach, mud from the lagoon, and then limestone from the coral reef. That's going to tell you that at this place, sea level was on the rise. You can tell because first it was a beach, then it was a lagoon, and then it was a reef. Right? So what you'll see is, again, sandstone, mudstone, limestone. This is the section formed during a transgression, sea level rise. Right? When the sea moves out, we have the opposite thing. We call this a regression. Right? So now... right? where we have our, 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 our sea level starting to go back out, right? We're getting beach sands deposited over top of those muds again, right? Time two, it's gone out even farther, right? Now we're getting mud over the limestone, right? So the mud is, is being pushed out farther over top of this limestone, the beach sand being pushed out even farther on top of that, right? And then farthest out, right? Now we get uh, dune sand, over top of, uh, of everything else, right? So what we'll see in a regressive sequence is the opposite. We'll see limestone from the, uh, from the uh, uh, coral reef, right? And as sea level lowers, we'll see mudstone from the, the, uh, the lagoon that was behind that reef. And as sea level lowers even more, we'll see sandstone first associated with dune or beach sand. 
and then possibly even dune sand if this continues to to go out even farther and this is again called a regressive sequence right so why do sedimentary layers end well this harks back to steno's principle of lateral continuity a layer will continue until it's forced to end well it can be forced to end because it changes that environment, right? The facies, it's no longer a beach facies. It's now a, a lagoon facies or a sand dune facies, right? So the end, end of the environment or by, you know, physical means, right? Deposited in the channel, it can't get outside of those river valleys. So though that's physically going to end or stop the deposition of this material. And so those are the two kind of ways we can end uh, a, 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 a sedimentary layer. Some other indicators of an environment, colors of rocks, right? Red can often indicate oxidation or, or, or aerial exposure. Green can mean uh, generally that it's, it's, it's underwater and it's not getting oxidized, getting reduced instead, right? Size, shape, sorting, we discussed that already, how those lead to environment, right? Thickness of those beddings, are we talking big, thick beds, thin beds? That's going to help us in, you know, determine what environment, the type of bedding. Is it graded? Is it sharp contact? Is it, you know, how is it, right? And then, uh, you know, features in there, mud cracks, uh, ripple marks, um, um, cross beds, all that kind of good stuff. And, of course, fossils. These are also going to really help us indicate what kind of environment we are in, right? Cross beds can indicate current direction. We talked about that, right? Direction is in the dip of these beds. Another interesting thing that can happen is you can get clast imbrication. So notice how these, these rocks are all kind of stacked or shoved on top of each other. That shows you that the current was going this way and pushing one rock kind of on top of another. And then we can see, of course, ripple marks, right? Sand dune ripples, wave ripples, water ripples. All of these are going to help us determine environment there's lots of good resources in sedimentary rocks groundwater we've already discussed uh petroleum oil natural gas right and of course coal these are all found in sedimentary rocks right cement from limestone this is going to be uh very important we have the largest limestone quarry in the world right outside rogers city michigan Salt, you know, very important for not only eating, but industrial applications, uh, road, you know, putting salt on roads in winter and stuff. And we do have the largest salt mine in the world underneath Detroit as well. Uh, uranium is also found in sandstone. So uh, back in the day, it was used to make glazes before we knew it, it was uh, radioactive. Uh, but we've been harvesting uranium in sandstone. This is called a roll front deposit where the uranium just kind of rolls through with the water. So studying the history of sedimentary rocks, uh, the idea is the present is the key to the past. The same things we see today have been going on in the past, both, you know, the slow uniformitarianist stuff and the catastro catastrophic volcanic eruptions, earth slide, you know, stuff like, or landslides, stuff like that, right? Um, we can learn about past environments, of course, from sedimentary rocks, past climates from sedimentary rocks, events that happened in the history, sequence of events, of course. We'll get back to that in the next chapter. Uh, and, of course, a history of ancient life around our planet, right? All right, folks, uh, if you enjoyed this